what are the chances of Yan going for this uh, line, Abby? Uh, like like zero, I think. If he plays Bishop B6, I, I will I will bow to Yan. So you can probably guess what's coming here, but it's worth sticking around for for this awesome reaction from the commentary team. Plus, just a great fight today, as ever, in this World Championship match. Now, Jan Nepomniashi, he had the white pieces here. It's game nine. Ding Loren with black, and Ding is trailing the match four and a half, three and a half. So e4 from Yan, no surprises there. And today we get e5, not e6, the French defence which Ding played in his last black game. Now we see knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, the Roy Lopez, no surprises, but this time there's no pawn a6, we see knight f6, the Berlin defence. So okay, what does Jan have in store for this? Well, rather than castling and going into all of the endgame stuff after knight takes on e4, he goes for this pawn d3 move, the kind of anti-Berlin systems Fabi was describing them as, because Fabi was in the commentary team, by the way, with Robert Hess and Tanya Sachdev. So we see bishop c5, great square for that piece. Now pawn c3, the classic structure for white. Both players castle, and this quick d5 is how lots of black players have been playing recently. But d6, also a good move there as well. And now we have a divergence of theory here. There's a lot of games with taking on d5, but Fabi mentioned that this move has been tried a lot more recently because white's actually pushing here a bit more than in the lines where you take on d5, he was saying. We now see pawn a5 played by Ding. And the idea of this is to stop b4, kicking this bishop from a great square. And of course it gains space. And so Yan now goes a4 in response, gains some space for himself. But by the way, the reason he didn't take this knight here and then capture the pawn on e5, which can be played, is that black gets a big initiative and has been shown to equalise in these positions. You know, this is what Fabi was saying, super GM of course. And you can even give a second pawn here, by the way, and get huge activity. The bishop coming here and everything like that. Ding well prepared. So instead, we see a4, the queen now comes to e7, and the idea of this is to protect this pawn to then free up this knight to re-manoeuvre as we'll see. Queen c2 improves the queen, the knight comes back to b8, preparing pawn c6, we see rook e1, rook d8, and now both players inserting these h3, h6 moves, and this knight starts to re-manoeuvre. Standard play by both players at this point c6 kicks the bishop, it jumps back to c4, and now knight a6 from ding is now leading to an interesting moment, because after knight g3 from nepo, it looks like this knight is now going to re-manoeuvre into c7 and then maybe e6, or support bishop e6, something like that. But instead, we see the queen go to c7. Looks a bit strange at first glance, but this is the top move of the engine. And Fabi did wonder whether Nepo's next move was to try and get Ding out of his prep. Because this bishop is already well placed on this square. Keeping an eye here, looking here. And so after you drop it back here, it begs the question, well, have you really improved that piece? Not so much, but it's not a bad move. It's the third move of the engine. You know, it wanted rook d1 as a top move. So maybe Nepo trying to get Ding out of book here. And b5 now played. Good move, striking, gaining space, and White would never want to capture this one because who are you really helping improve their position? Well, Black, you've now opened that diagonal for the bishop to de uh, develop there and put pressure on your pawn. So coming back here, instead, Queen e2 played. Pressures b5, but also looks to transfer into f3 once this knight moves, as we'll see. We now see rook b8, not the engine's favourite move, but okay, not a bad one. We'll stick with the game, supports this pawn. We now see knight h4 coming onto these light squares, and now this bishop nudges back to f8, very standard idea. Sometimes you can go king h7 and pawn g6, using the support of those pieces for this pawn, and also it clears c5 for the knight to jump there in future. Now we see queen f3, threat on the board to take this pawn, Pawn recaptures and then pick up this knight. But Ding does allow it and go for counterplay on the queen side, and it is the best way to play strategically. I was having a quick click around, you know, what if you protect that pawn with the king, and then the line goes, the knight jumps in here, and knight g8 is apparently the best move. And this is quite an ugly construction, you know, I can understand why Ding didn't want to go for this. So instead, he takes on a4. 
allows this move, but he's getting counterplay now with knight c5 and the rook crashing through here. Now he didn't take that pawn straight away, he instead improves the knight, basically because white doesn't have a good way to defend it. Say you did this one for example, well then there's things like knight d3 coming, bishop e6 is good, this pawn comes under lots of pressure anyway and is likely to drop, especially when this one's cramping it. So coming back here, we see knight g6 played instead by Nepo, he doesn't try and defend this b pawn. He attacks this bishop using this pinned pawn, using the bishop back here. And now the rook takes on b2, we see captures here, the rook recaptures, and this bishop nudges back. Not the computer's top move, but not a bad one. You know, it comes away from the attack, pressures this knight. So knight h7 played, hits the bishop, it drops to c1, hits this rook, and now technically best was rook c2, although it's a tricky move to play because you're running into bishop b1. Now, okay, there is a tactic here to then go knight b3, black's doing better, but there are other tricky things that could be going on after rook c2. So Ding prefers to keep it simple, drop back to b5, but this sets up an interesting tactical moment because bishop a3 is now played, slicing down that diagonal and setting up a threat of bishop c4. But what does Ding do? He ignores it, top engine way to play, rook e8 on the board, letting bishop c4 come, but here's the big point from Ding Loren. He does not move the rook, he gives the exchange if Nepo wants it. Bishop e6, excellent move. And this is where Fabi says this. If he plays bishop e6, I, I, will, I will bow to Jan. So now you can guess what happened, right? Did this rook get captured? No, this one chops off and we get a great reaction from it. But first, just to show you why this one wasn't taken, well, you can play like this, but black gets huge compensation. You can see the grip on the light squares here, and also rook c8 is gonna put huge pressure on this pawn, and these rooks are kinda of hemmed in. You know, they're not really blasting in an open board. It's tricky. So instead, we see captures on e6, eliciting this reaction from the commentary team. He finds that option. Oh my God. Jan's a beast. For percent, he's like... <laughs> Just to prove me wrong, he plays it. Okay, so the knight recaptures. Now we see this knight jump into f5, and there's a threat to jump into d6, fork the rooks. So c5 was played, blocking out the bishop, and now queen e2 hits the rook, it saves itself, and now the queen improves to c4, pressuring the a-pawn. Queen c6 defends. Bishop c1 nudges back, opens up the rook to take that pawn, and now knight f6 from Ding, he improves that piece back into the game. We see queen takes on a4, queen captures, rook captures, and we start to see this liquidation of pawns. But Nepo doesn't immediately take the a pawn, he first goes bishop to b2, because after the rook moves, now you can take here. If you'd started with taking that a pawn, then knight d4 was getting a bit annoying, supported by the two pawns. So this was a better way to go. Now rook b4 offers the exchange, you do not want to take there and connect the black passes. So instead, takes on a5 played, we see captures on e4, and we start to get some liquidation, heading towards what should be a drawn end game, but there's a lot of play let to go, uh, yet to go. Now, knight d4 was played here. This knight is attacked, you can save it with knight d2, game goes on, but Ding just trusts his end game technique. So he offers a pawn here, which Nepo snaps off, and he's now pawn ahead, wanting to grind this end game out. Now if the knights were off the board, it'd be a very simple draw, but with the knights on, there are still opportunities. Should be a draw, however, but it'd be a lot harder if there was an E pawn and an H pawn. This is something that Fabi was saying. Then you've got more opportunity to create a pass pawn, create problems. G6 kicks this knight, it drops back into E3. King G7, Rook B4, Knight G3 now played, and it's a nice tricky move. If you capture, well, Black takes here, again, theoretical draw. So instead, the Rook comes to the seventh. Now Knight F5, and this is an interesting moment too. You know, Ding's literally offering this horrible pawn structure because he just backs his ability to draw this. You know, these guys know their end games. I'd be a bit scared there, right? So Nepo, he doesn't want to try Ding on that one. He wants to keep the knights on. There are better chances in that position. Rook E7, Ding offers the rook trade. 
Nepo decides no. We see rook e1 check, king h2. Rook e2 pressures this pawn. And after rook b7, knight d6 hitting the rook, it slid across and now king f8 sets up a threat. The pawn is no longer pinned to the king. And so f5's on the card, kicking the cards, kicking this knight, and then you can pick up the f pawn. So we see king g3, pawn f5 played, and it's a nice defensive idea from Nepo because he throws in this move, picks up a temper on the rook, it moves away, and now we see check, the rook blocks, and these ones, they come off the board. Knight e5, so can Ding hold on here? He's a pawn down, Nepo's gonna keep pressuring. That one pushes on, and h4 now is a nice idea because after captures, it gives the king access to this square and you can start pressuring these ones. But this is a really cool and calm move now from Ding. Pawn to h3. That pawn was gonna be rounded up at some point anyway, so by chucking it like this, you ruin the white structure, and it was the top engine move. Great play. Now king e7, knight c6 check, king f6, knight d4, and knight e4. And Ding has got a good defensive setup here. His king's active, his knight's active, and at the end of the day, if you trade off these two pawns, well then you can just chop this one with the knight, it's gonna be a draw. And this is essentially what we see now, lots and lots of dancing. So I don't wanna bore you to tears here, let's just flick through these moves and you get the idea. Ding's on form with this technique, no issues, it hops around. Okay, we'd likely mess this up, right, as mere mortal amateurs, but not these guys, they're too good. Now the pawn kicks on, and in this position here, few more moves, we finally see a liquidation. Draw agreed, because that one's about to drop, completely level game. So Ding, he holds the fort today, well done to him. Nepo pressed a bit, nothing crazy. Next game, Ding's got white, looking to strike back in the match. If you want to see another amazing game between these two players, then check out the video on the screen. Thanks very much for watching, and see you soon.